Hey y'all, in this video, I'm going to show you the steps I took to tram my Gatton CNC router after the big move. Now, what I'm going to show you is not the only way to do it. It's not the best way to do it. It's not the worst way to do it. It's just the way I did it. Your mileage may vary. Check with your machine manufacturer for instructions on how to tram your CNC router. But having said that, if you want to see how I trammed my Gatton CNC, stick around. Okay, I've added a couple of toys to my arsenal when it comes to adjusting tram on my CNC router. But I'm going to start with one of the same pieces that I had in my previous video. And that is my dial indicator, and it's mounted to a piece of half inch dowel as you can see and I've got it in my half inch collet for my router. One of the new things that I got was this granite index plate. Now this is a class B index plate for what I'm doing for woodworking that's more than adequate. I don't need four digit accuracy. So the first thing I'm going to do is I've located this on my table. I used some squares and I drew out a little area and I have my index plate sitting right here located on my table. Now I'm going to put my dial indicator in the router and just tighten it down hand tight. I am not going to be turning on the router. Now what I need to do is I need to go around and measure at these four corners just to index, see which is the high spot and which is the low spot. So I will bring my z-axis down and I'm going to collapse that till it's roughly 100 thou. And I'm going to adjust my gauge to zero. Then I'm going to bring it up here to this front corner here. I'm going to start on this corner and I'm going to see where I'm at on each of these four corners. I do not know which corner is higher than which. So let's bring it up towards the front. Oops. Take it back off a single step. Yeah, roughly a quarter inch away from the edge. Let's drag it over to this side. Roughly a quarter inch away from each edge. Now I'm reading ten thousandths here, so I'm going to write that down. Plus ten. Now I'm going to move to the back corner. And I'm reading minus 90, so uh, minus 10 thousandths there. So that's negative 10. This corner is 20 thousandths higher than this one. So let's scoot over here. Oh, that's way down. That is 19,000. So that's negative 19. Now let's come up to this front corner. About a quarter of an inch away from the edge. And I am minus 1,000. Minus 1. Okay, this is my high side. So I need to shim these three corners up until they're all reading the same number. It does not have to read zero. If shimming these up, drop this corner down slightly. So long as these are all reading the same number, 
we're fine. Then I know we have a level plane out here to tram this router head to. Now, as you can see, I do not baby my spoil board. So I don't know, it looks like this corner is sitting over the top of a groove. So it could drop down below the surface here. So I'm going to be going around and probably shimming all four corners. So let's go ahead and get on that. I can see right now that this corner is 11 thousandths lower than this corner. This one is 20 thousandths. This one is 29 thousandths. How did I get that? This corner is plus 10, so I need to add that plus 10 to all of these numbers here. So, we'll go ahead and we will start leveling this corner up, this uh, block out. So, I have here a collection of business cards and scraps of paper that I'm going to use to try to level this puppy out. So let's go, the lowest corner was this corner back here. Let's go back here. Okay, that brought that up to negative six. So I still have a ways to go. Let's take another business card. Now that brought that up to positive nine. This was positive ten. Let me check this corner again. Now that did drop that corner down because now I'm at plus five. So I'm at plus five. Let's go back here again. And I'm at plus nine. So I have a four thousandths of an inch difference in the height here and here. But I'm going to check my other corners and get them arranged as well. This was the next lowest corner. And that brought that up to negative six. So let me get a thin business card here. Now I'm negative two. Now I'm at positive two. The reason I'm not going up and trying to hit the positive 10 on all of this is because as I add shims in one place or another, it's going to change the level of everything. Now let's come back over here to the front. Whoops, I just drove it off. Lift up my pointer, get back on the block. Okay, I'm at plus six thousandths. I'm at plus eleven. That means this end, this edge needs to come up as well. So let me put another piece in there. So let me go ahead around this entire board several times and we'll come back when I have my uh, block leveled. Okay, I really don't know if you can see in the camera or not, but after going around and leveling all of this, I am now within a half a thou on each corner. Back here I'm reading plus, I'm reading plus eight, plus eight, seven and three quarter, not quite eight. I mean, not even a needle width away from eight. And plus eight. So, for my purposes, I'm within a quarter of a thou over here on this corner. 
that's good enough for this block. This, the surface of this block is now level. Now, the other toy that I picked up, I described them kind of half-heartedly in my first tramming video, and that is an Edge Technology Pro tram system. Now, I purchased this off of Amazon, and there's a link down in the description below. Uh, I purchased this. Edge Technology did not send it to me. I just decided after seeing enough people using them that this was the way I wanted to go. Yes, I could still mount my dial indicator in my little plywood beam here and swing it back and forth, but the combination of using this thick index plate, which won't flex, and the dual indicators should help me really, really dial this in. So, let me go ahead and switch over. I'll pull my dial indicator out of here. And I'll put my Pro Tram tool in, in my quarter inch collet. Then I'll put, mount this in the router. Again, hand tight. I will not be turning the router on. Now the first thing I need to do is I want to center this gauge. And then I want to calibrate my gauges. And that's going to require me to go around to the back of the machine again. Edge Technology sends you this little magnet, which is a known height. What I need to do is put this magnet on the tip of this gauge. And it doesn't matter which one I do. It could be either or. Then I want to bring my Z down. and run the gauge all the way around to one. Okay. This gauge is now set to zero. Now, what I want to do, lift this up, take the magnet off, spin it around, and I'll have to go around to the back of the CNC, and Look at this gauge. This gauge, should, I need to adjust this to where it is set at zero. That way the two gauges are calibrated to the same height. So let me get out my screwdriver here and loosen up the lock screw. Go around the back. Then adjust this gauge until it reads zero. Okay, then I can tighten that screw back up, keep that gauge from turning around. Now with both of my gauges adjusted to where they're both zeroed to the height of this magnet, I can put it back in the case, put the case away. and I'm ready to start tramming. Okay, now, as we talked about, when it comes time to tram the router, we're adjusting nod and tilt. So, we're looking at, does the router lean forward or backward along the Y, or is it just twisted along the X? The first thing you want to check is nod because adjusting nod is going to require shims either up on top or down below. If I adjust the tilt first, I'm going to undo all of that to adjust the nod. So I'll get the nod done out of the way first, then I can adjust the tilt. 
So the first thing I need to do is I need to make sure that all of my mounts are torqued properly and to the same pressure. This is important. I know it looks like overkill to use a little torque wrench. But if I don't tighten these up evenly, that could change the nod of the CNC. Especially if I take a reading, loosen it up, put the uh, shims in place, tighten it back down, and don't get it as tight as I had before, I'm not getting an accurate reading. So by making sure I tighten all four fasteners to the same torque every time, I'm assured that I'm pushing that plate as far back this time as I had it last time. So let me just check torque and I'm going for nothing extravagant. I'm just going for 40 inch pounds. Forty inch pounds all the way around. I now know that those four bolts are tightened evenly. And at 40 inch pounds, it's not super tight. It's not going to deform anything, but it's going to allow me to make certain that I have all those fasteners tightened to the same amount every time. So now I'm going to spin my gauge this direction. Take my torque wrench off of the table. I want to make sure I don't have anything up on the table besides this. Let's come around here. Okay. Single step. Okay, my left gauge is now at zero. And my right gauge is reading negative, negative 14. So, that means my nod forward is 14 thousandths. The top of the router is 14 thousandths of an inch forward of the back of the router. So now I'll need to loosen these up, get me a, find me a shim that's roughly 14 thousandths, put it in, and tighten it back down to 40 inch pounds, check it again. Now with that shim in place, I can check my gauges, see what I've got, see how that changed it. Okay, I have zero on my left gauge, and I'm still reading negative two on my right hand gauge. So I have a two thousandths difference. Let me see if I have a two thousandths strip shim on my uh, right here. Let me back that off again and install this other shim. Okay, after a little bit of backing and forthing with different shim thicknesses, I have finally, take you off and bring you over, I am reading zero on both gauges. So, the nod is trammed out of the router. So, 
put you back in here in the tripod. And now we go to tramming out the tilt. Spin it around sideways, facing me, thankfully. And now I'm going to bring it up. Okay, and now we will bring the router down. And again, I want to bring this down to zero and see where I'm at on this gauge. I'm reading zero on this gauge, and I'm reading 20, 24 thousandths out on this gauge. So that means my router is twisted this way. I'm positive over here, I'm at zero there. This probe is touching the index plate first. So I need to bring it back this direction. So that means I will have to loosen these bolts just slightly. Not enough to lose my shim out of there, but enough to where I can tilt the mounting plate. Zero and 15 thou. Let's try a little bit more here. Zero and 13 thou. Now you probably noticed that I have an eccentric bushing here, an offset bushing. These are generally used to adjust tension on uh, V-groove bearings, but they can also be used to adjust an offset in twist. And that's exactly what I'm going to do now. That's got it down to uh, seven and, okay, let's back off here just a second. Now I'm at minus four plus two. Okay, let me bring this up. Zero on my left gauge. I'm at two thousandths on my right gauge. I'm about one and a half thou. I'm at one thou on both. Let's take it up to zero and see what I get. And let me take you off the tripod again. Zero on both scales. Now I just need to torque down my mount and I am ready to go. So, torque it down and see if it changes. It probably will.
40, 40 inch pounds. It did not change. Here's where it probably will change. It did change. One thou. And this is the part that can drive you nuts. Tightening these bolts tilted the router head one thou. So, let me see if I can adjust that out. Zero, zero, perfect. Let's make sure I'm still tight. Forty. Forty. Now that loosened way up. Forty. Now the fun part. I need to get my wrench and hold this offset bushing while I'm torquing down this bolt. There we are, zero and zero. Okay, so it's the next day. I just came out and checked it. The tram is still good. It should not have changed. I didn't expect it to, and it didn't. But now what I need to do is I need to torque my mounting plate down to its final torque. So we'll start up here. Now the fun one. And the indicators have not moved. Now let's see if they moved. So I'll bring you in for a wee bit of a close up here. If I can get the camera to cooperate and focus on the gauge. So that's it. The tramming is completed, thankfully. Now I can carry on with sorting out my temporary dust collection system, surface this spoil board, and actually start using the CNC after the big move. Now, I know I'm going to have a lot of questions about what I did, how I did it, and why I used the materials, tools, and supplies I used. I've tried to anticipate some of those questions, and I'm going to try to address them right now. Number one, why did I need to retram my router? Well, simply put, I moved it. This router was built in the old shed, in situ, for that location and that environment. Now, that old shed was built in the 80s on a very small budget. And I don't want to cast any aspersions on the people that did the work, but I think after they poured the concrete, they troweled it smooth with a garden rake, then finished it with a chainsaw. Now, I can't confirm or deny that, but that's what it looks like. So suffice to say, that floor is uneven. It's crazy. When I moved it in here onto a much smoother floor, it threw everything off. It threw off while well, the table was out of level, which in and of itself is not necessarily bad because you can surface the spoil board to make up for it. But it was so far out of level, one corner was a half inch higher than the other corner. It worked in there off of that uneven floor, but it didn't work in here. That introduced twist and it caused a whole bunch of other issues. So I had to go over the entire thing. I didn't pull it apart, but I went over the entire thing 
and adjusted twist out, leveled everything as good as I could and made sure everything was running nice and square. You'll see shims under V-groove bearings and behind bolts and things where they didn't used to be. That's what happens when you build something in one place and then move it to another place. So just know that if you build a machine for a specific location, then move it to a new location. You may not have to do everything I did, but check it. Check everything before you put it back into service. Save yourself a lot of grief. Next is, why didn't I do a video or show the work I did after I moved it? Well, basically because it's not only machine specific, it was very, very personal to my situation. If you check your machine after moving it, you may not have to do a thing. And you probably won't have to do what I did based on what type of machine, what brand of machine that you have. Now, the next question is, why did I use the Edge Technologies Pro Tram system and do you need one? Second answer first, no, you don't need one. I showed in my previous video how to use just a standard dial indicator and a little plywood beam that I came up with to mount this in my router and check tram and adjust tram that way. In fact, machinists will tell you that a beam like that with a uh, dial indicator mounted in it is how they check tram and adjust tram on like Bridgeport milling machines. Well, number one, this isn't a Bridgeport milling machine. It's not made to be adjusted over and over again for different setups. It's made to be adjusted once, set it, recheck it every once in a while, but it's meant to be left alone. You can get by with a little setup like this with a dial indicator and it will work. I ran it that way for almost four years. I decided to get the ProTram system because I had seen a bunch of people using them and I had been asked questions about them so often I decided to go ahead and invest in one and see if it was worth the hype. See, did it make anything easier? And I'm here to tell you, I can't comment on whether the quality of the tramming job I did is, with this is any better than using the single indicator in the beam, but I can tell you it went a lot faster. So it was ease of use, it was the amount of time it took, and the number of questions I got on it, as well as me seeing other people use one, then maybe decide to go ahead and buy one and see if it was worth it. I can't say it'll be worth it to you because I don't know your situation. For me, I think it was a worth, worthwhile investment. So that's why the Pro Tram system. Why the surface plate? Well, if you look at that old video, and as I did when reviewing the footage, if you look very carefully in certain segments where I'm moving that dial indicator back and forth, every time that dial indicator got over an area of that glass that was not supported by shims, the glass would deflect just slightly. There was just enough spring pressure on that piece of glass to make it deflect, which made me wonder how accurate were the readings I was getting. Now, yes, I was using thin glass. I was using a piece of eighth inch thick glass out of a picture frame. Not the best surface to use. Quarter inch probably would have been much, much better. I didn't have any at the time. This is a class B surface plate. It is considered the lowest accuracy of mar uh, granite surface plates. It is what's considered for shop floor use. Yes, you can get smoother, flatter, higher quality surface plates, uh, grade AA or laboratory grade, etc. But you're going to pay hundreds, possibly thousands of dollars for one. Surface plates are not cheap. This little surface plate was right around $40. And I put a link to it down in the description box below. 
as well as a link to the Edge Technologies ProTram mini system that I used. Hashtag not sponsored. The reason I went with the surface plate was because I knew at an inch and a half thick there is no way I could put enough pressure with this little spring-loaded dial indicator or these two spring-loaded dial indicators on the ProTram system. There's no way I could put enough pressure to deflect that piece of granite. That was number one. Also, I need it for a couple of other projects. I thought the timing was right. Do you need one of these granite surface plates? No, you don't. You can get by with a piece of glass. So long as it's smooth and flat, you can use that as your surface to tram off of. And finally, where did I get 40 inch pounds as a number to torque these bolts down to? Basically, that was an assembly torque. I knew it would be tight enough to hold that mount in place while I was making adjustments, but not close enough to my final torque to where I had to start worrying about distortion, either distorting the plywood or possibly stripping out a T-nut, stripping out a, the plywood that the T-nut's attached to, or any other variables. Once I got everything done, I then went back and torqued it down to 55 inch pounds. 55 is just fine. That mount's not going anywhere. Again, 40 was just a torque that I could get all of those bolts tightened to just to make sure I tightened them all evenly. I could have used 20, I could have used 30, I could have used 50. Now, I know that there is no way I answered everybody's question just now, and this is running too long anyway. So this afternoon at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, I'll be hosting a live Q&A session where we can discuss anything I've shown in this video or any of my previous videos. Again, that's today at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, right here on my YouTube channel. And I've put a link to that live Q&A down in the description box of this video. I've also put a link to my first tramming video down in the description box of this video. Now these live Q&A sessions are just one more reason to go ahead and subscribe to my channel if you're not already a subscriber. And when you click that red subscribe button, click that little bell icon right next to it. Then click it a second time and set that menu to all notifications. Then you'll get a notification the next time I post a video and the next time I go live. So I hope to see you this afternoon for the live Q&A session. And as always, whether you subscribe to my channel or not, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to watch and y'all take care.